Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jos Graham. P uh, welcome to my talk, which known as Programming is Debugging, So Debug Better. Um, I mean, um, so this is a general talk about debugging. If you saw the, the notes, um, there are a couple of languages that I use a fair amount uh, in the middle of it, such as there's a fair amount of Ruby, some Perl, some JavaScript. But the idea here is to present general debugging tips for anybody who's coding. Most of these tips are aimed at uh, beginners and intermediate coders, although the thing that consistently amazes me with this stuff is how many really experienced coders manage to miss a lot of these tips and spend far longer debugging things than they should. So. I have debug software for these people. I currently work for an international consultancy called NEO, which does agile development and lean, uh, lean business uh, consulting. I used to work for the Digital Village, a startup best known for having Douglas Adams as its creative director. And I worked on various things related to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, Starship Titanic, if anybody played that in the past. Also, I, for six years previous till now, I worked for Linden Labs, the company that runs Second Life. Um, which, and for all of these companies, I did a whole load of random troubleshooting. And um, I won't tell you now, but later on, if you want to hear about the kinds of bugs that manifest themselves in virtual worlds, I will tell you stories about saving ice skating horses from starvation. <laughs> and even stranger ones that I can't tell in public. Um, so here is an example of different levels of bugs. We have extreme bugginess some bugginess and no bugginess at all. Now, if I told you that I could take your code from extreme bugginess to no bugs at all, hands up everybody who would not believe me. Correct. <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's software, therefore it has bugs. The best I can do is possibly something like that, but we will see. Um, this is an excerpt from a fabulous article, which I highly recommend um, looking up from Fastcut. It's still on the net. Um, and it is about a piece of software that has hardly any bugs in it at all. As it says, the last seven ver 11 versions of the software had a total of 17 errors compared to other software of that size, which would have 5,000 errors. And if you're wondering what software this is that is so remarkably bug-free, the clue is in the article title. It is software written by Lockheed Martin for running the Space Shuttle. Now, if you're looking for tips about how to write software that is this bug-free, be warned that you may not want to. As it says, the specs for the current program fill 30 volumes and run to 40,000 pages. So this is the opposite of Agile. This is waterfall. This is more waterfall than Niagara Falls, <laughs> right? You don't want to do this, but they have. And the point is that even after doing this, they had still 17 errors, or rather, as I point out, 17 known errors. There may have been other bugs in there that they didn't catch. There was a wonderful article recently in the New York Times uh, by Ellen Ullman, where she talks about what it's like to be a programmer. And a quote by, from John Pack Backus that says, that ends with, you keep doing that over and over until you find something that works which sounds incredibly tedious and depressing and hopeless. And I'm here to tell you, it'll be OK. And there's loads of things we can do to make it better. By the way, Ellen Ullman um, wrote, as well as being a, fat, uh, uh, a fantastic programmer and write, wrote an excellent novel called The Bug, which is a novel about software quality analysis. It's actually really good. So because I realized that the initial description would have turned you off completely, I highly recommend it. Um, has the water arrived yet? Or Oh, thank you very much. It's drying out very quickly. So the reason I'm here to tell you all this is because I have been in the situation too many times, as too many other people have been, of, as a hobbyist coder, coming up with an idea one day, sitting in the evening with your computer out, being really excited about coding something. And two hours later, all you've got is a pile of bugs, and you haven't actually advanced anywhere. Has anybody been in this situation? There you go. You have a great idea, you hit a load of bugs, and that idea dies on the vine. Bugs are awful. This is what they do. And it's not just hobbyist projects, software projects. This is why software engineering is hard, right? This is why Gantt charts suddenly go spiraling out of control. Because when you hit a bug, you don't actually know how long it's going to take to fix. So things I'll be going through, as well as bug killing tactics, some of the strategies you can use to prevent the bugs ever appearing in the first place. We're going to be talking about some tools and also about pony thieves, which I will explain in a moment. <laughs> but overall, this thing, as I said, is going to consist mainly of a whole lot of tips that should be blatantly obvious, and yet loads of people 
miss them. And also, if you're an experienced programmer and you're writing tools for people, you're writing libraries, I'm hoping to tell you how to stop stealing ponies. I will explain that again in a minute. But this is one of the most useful graphs I've ever seen about the lifetime of bugs. The main thing to know is that the cost and pain of repairing a bug goes up exponentially as the bug ages. If you can fix the bug before you even make its unit test while you're still coding it, then it's almost free. However, if the bug makes it out to, for example, a QA pass, then you've wasted an entire iteration. You've spent QA time documenting the bug. You have to then go and fix the bug and go through all those processes. If it even makes it out to production, it's way, way more expensive, including all the cle uh, cleanup time. So we need to ideally fix as many bugs as possible in this space. Uh, here's a much simpler graph, which I used to, to explain the overall concept, um, which is generally, I find that the amount of time I'm not doing debugging is spent with much, with much happier things. Right? I like cake and ponies. I think everybody should have cake and ponies, gluten-free cake if you need. Um, and when I say cake and ponies, I'm mainly using an analogy here. I tend to think of cake as money and ponies as time, a uh, time that could be spent riding ponies. And the trouble is that this time gets taken away from me by pony thieves. Right? And pony thieves are when there's a compiler error that doesn't explain things. It's when there's a library bug. It's when there's stuff that really hasn't been thought of in terms of usability, right? This is my valuable time, and some lazy software designer or coder somewhere is taking it away from me. So let's get on to, excuse me, some of the tips. As I say, they're mostly going to seem fairly obvious, but it is amazing how many people don't do them. First one being the most obvious. If you've got an error, read it. No, actually read it, <laughs> right? Because errors usually have line numbers, error types, failing operations, additional context, and if you're lucky, a hint for fixing it. And it is amazing how many times I've been in debugging sessions with engineers where there is a crucial fact in the error that they have overlooked. They see a red error popping up. They jump to the code. They haven't actually looked to find out what line it's on, what kind of error it is, because they automatically assume they know what the error is coming from. And a lot of the times, they're wrong. And even if you are reading the error, and you start up reading the error, and then you go into the um, uh, debugging phase, and you're spending a while debugging, one thing that often gets missed is the fact that errors may change while you're debugging. And if you're continually in a rerun process, you may just do a fix check it, still got an error, do a fix, check it. And you don't notice that two, like, two minutes into the 10 minute process, your error actually changed. You've been fixing an error that is already fixed and you haven't noticed. And this is, um, I wouldn't say it's pony theft, but it's definitely a pony positive opportunity. <laughs> there are loads of automatic test runners, and here I'm using RSpec or like wrapped in Guard, the uh, Ruby automatic test runner, that it would be great if it told me that OK, it's still got an error, but it's a different error to the one it has befo had before. It's never passed, but it's, things have changed. I would like to see an alert on that. If you write test running software, please add this feature. It would be incredibly useful. Similarly, for as I said, the bugs that you can catch during the coding process are the cheapest and easiest to fix. So if your editor has a syntax checking module or syntax checking plugin, please turn it on. Here we have Sublime Text 2 some Ruby code, and I have a Ruby syntax checker. What, we, what we've got going on is that there is a syntax error on line 71. It has drawn a red box around the syntax error, and here it's giving me warnings. Um, and most editors, like um, especially if you're using things, the, the more bare bones ones or minimalist ones like Vim, don't have this stuff turned on by default. It will save you so much time if you actually go and install this stuff. And the key lesson we're learning here is about Fast iterations maintain momentum. You may think that if you've got syntax checking not going on in the editor and you just hit run, it takes the, um, the time to discovery of the bug from 10 seconds to 30 seconds. That's still a three times lengthening, right? And anything you can do to cut down the time you spent debugging helps maintain your momentum. Now, I, I've left Perl behind a while ago. I used to be a big Perl fan. And there are still certain things about Perl that I really, really miss. And this is one of them. This is a beautiful error message. I realize that sounds like a contradiction in terms. But if you look at it, what we've got is a syntax error, where it's saying the syntax error has actually been detected by the compiler at line 54. 
But in parentheses on the next line, it's making a guess. It's not certain that this is true, but it's very possible that you may, the bug may actually be on line 47. I love this. This saves so much time. If you write compilers or debuggers and you have the chance to do a little extra work to do this, please do this. You will save so many coding years of time um, in all the people using your software. And the point to know as both a person who writes compilers or somebody uses compilers is that compiler errors and warnings are your friends. When you start programming, this gets really frustrating because you want something to compile and run, especially if you're using a really persnickety language like Java, right? You have Java is incredibly picky about the syntax and using classes and things like that. And you won't be able to compile. You'll try something, it won't compile. You'll try something else, it won't compile. The reason why compiler errors are your friends is because compile time bugs are so much easier to fix than runtime bugs. And one of the problems with dynamic languages, in fact, this is, this is a reason why some people prefer strongly typed languages such as, say, the C family or, or Haskell or something like that, is because more of the errors are moved from runtime to compile time. If you're using a dynamic language like Ruby or JavaScript, most of these, for example, type checking errors won't be caught at compile time. And they will be much harder to fix in the long run. Um, this is the most egregious form of pony theft I've seen in a long time. This is actually a live screen from something I was helping some colleagues debug last week. This is the Chrome uh, console, JavaScript console. And the problem is on the fourth line down, what you've got is a syntax error. Now, can anybody tell me where in the code that syntax error has happened? Or what body of text the syntax error has happened in? Or anything? Not a bloody clue. We were just looking at this, our mouths hanging open. Don't do this, <laughs> for the love of God. <laughs> we will return to this bug later. So we had, firstly, read the error. But there's other contextual information, such as the stack trace. Okay? You've got the error. Then you've got the list of all the method calls that led up to the error. Now, not all programming languages uh, print this out. So here is, there are going to be many tips from various different software experienced coders during this talk. And here is the first one. Jose Valim, um, who is a key member of the Ruby community, but is also writing his own language called Elixir. Uh, one of his key tips was, if you're not getting a track stack trace, print one out and read it through. It's really useful to see the paths that the interpreter took or compiler took to get to the area that you're in. That context is incredibly helpful. So actually print it out and read it. And if you're a Java coder, then print the whole thing out on paper, take it home and read it overnight. Um, number three, Google the error. Again, amazing how many people don't do this. Now, people, it's understandable why people don't do this, because you tend to think, this is my code. It's new code. I've created it. If I'm Googling for it, nobody else has written my code. I won't find it. But there are many cases when actually it will turn up. Key example being situations where you're using a particular framework or library, and you're getting a very specific error message. And especially if it's coming from a specific line in the library itself rather than in your code, the chances are that a Google is going to turn up um, something that deals with that, especially Stack Overflow. Right? Stack Overflow is wonderful for this kind of stuff. And often, especially one of the things to bear in mind when you're dealing with libraries and frameworks is that some of the time, especially if it's an immature library, the bug may be in the library itself. If you're dealing with stuff, especially if you like Node.js, where you have it's a very young, exciting language and framework, and, and people are coming up with new modules all the time, and they're completely riddled with bugs. Right? There is a good chance that the bug that you're encountering is actually a bug in the package. And so going to the repo, like for example, if it's a GitHub project, going to its issues page and searching in there, because GitHub has a lovely search engine somewhere, probably, um, for searching issues. You no, know, it does really. Mm. Keeps moving. Yeah, it's like, where is it this week? Um, but there's definitely something to bear in mind when you're using libraries that are immature, is that they may cause more problems than they solve. So be careful of that. Um, the next one, so we're in a situation where we've got a bug, we've Googled it, we can't see anything. Or we've done stack trace, we're looking at the code, we can't see anything. One of the key tips is that, that actually I did not include in here, is, but it's my own personal one, which is if you're spending an hour staring at the same four lines of code, the bug is probably not in those four lines. Right? So you've been staring at it, it's doing yourself, just it's now time to get some help elsewhere. Um, what really helps is you have a mental image of how your software works and how your code works. 
but you're focusing on a very tight area of it. If you explain it to somebody else, what will happen is that you have to explain all the context around it. And so your brain will do the work of decorating all that with a whole load of external context. As you do that explanation, the chances are, OK, who's had the situation of going over to a colleague, starting to explain a bug, and then going, oh, wait, I know what it was. And the colleague says, glad I could help. <laughs> there we go. What I found really helps is tempting Mur using Murphy's Law right, on your side. Go to the colleague whose respect you most value. <laughs> <laughs> Right? The one who you least want to look like an idiot in front of. Uh, for This is for the really bad bugs. Right? Um, but of course, the thing is that if you're doing this, it doesn't necessarily have to be talking to a human. Um, what the famous term rubber duck debugging. Right? Talk to an inanimate object. Or actually, a friend of mine um, uh, called John Aquino uh, once did a YouTube video, which I should link to, um, uh, where it's just 10 minutes of him looking at the camera, stroking his chin, and nodding which is great for talking to and only feels slightly less stupid than talking to a rubber duck. Um, but there are other ways of getting stuff out there. Um, Val Aurora, who has been wandering around this very conference, uh, she said one of the things she finds most useful is getting these ideas out, getting the structure down in a visual form, diagrammatically. So grab some paper, start sketching out the wider context of your system. Okay, and this is something, she does Linux file system hacking, okay, which is seriously bloody hardcore. Um, so other di these kinds of ways of getting the context out there and seeing the wood for the trees. Okay, so um, we've got a bug, we're trying to fix it, and we're working through stuff, but each time we have to try and rerun and, and check whether it's still there. So the obvious thing here is create a repro test, okay? Find, uh, write some code that automatically reproduces the bug. Now, um, if you're worried that you come to another talk and people around you are, are getting really religious really about tests and test-driven development, and you're looking for a safe haven from that to hear a different opinion, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's something that I didn't used to be so into, and now these days, I've, the recent work I've been doing has been totally TDD. Now, it's not saying you have to use tests for everything, especially exploratory code, or what we know as spikes in Agile world. Um, but the thing that really helps is that if you have a test harness already set up, then writing an additional test is so much easier. And furthermore, having test coverage for your bugs means that you prevent regressions. Pre regressions are the most common types of bugs, which is a bug that you fixed two months ago that has suddenly reared its head again. Okay, so building up a test library is incredibly useful for all kinds of things. Um, just as you can see, all these, and I particularly find it useful for refactoring, because when you have a big arch software architecture and you want to completely move it around, then having really good unit test coverage on it makes it so much easier. It makes the, takes the job down from a couple of weeks to a couple of days, and it means you are much more likely to, to uncover a bug a month later. So, this is about. This is much more, we're now moving into kind of bug prevention rather than bug cure. And if you have automated processes around this, then what you find is that it can prevent a huge class, many classes of bugs from ever appearing. And really, that's the best kind of bugs to, to fix is the ones you never have to deal with. Uh, if you have this automated process, then you can add loads of kind of other stuff in there to make your code better, right? To have these continual checks, such as linters, coverage checkers, complexity analysis tools. These are all different ways of analyzing your code and throwing up warnings about things that you should fix before they become a problem, okay? So how do you get one of these automated systems going? Well, what you want is a, what's known as continuous integration server. Um, you can either run something like Jenkins locally, which is a very popular one, or you can, there are now continuous integration systems in the cloud. For example, I've used one called CircleCI. It literally took, I'm not kidding, I had a GitHub repo. It took literally five clicks, no typing, before CircleCI was checking out my repo, running it, running all the tests, watching every single commit I did, and telling me about the results. It was just easily the best five clicks I've ever done. <laughs> Well, in the past week, anyway. Um, and similarly, you can plug in all these. Uh, there are many free open source tools, as well as things like Code Climate, which is a hosted service that can continually check, for example, your Ruby code for problems. And you have different ways of, uh, for example, if you're testing web apps, then instead of needing a whole load of different browsers running on machines, then some of these so hosted services, such as Source Labs, will, run all, will fire up browsers for you, run all the tests. So you don't need to have a machine running IE8. 
another tip. Uh, this is Jim Wyrick, who, as well as being uh, the creator of Rake, um, I'm very honored to say is a colleague of mine at NEO. And we are talking about the divide and conquer approach, which is you have a whole load of code. There is a bug in it somewhere. Ideally, you want to narrow that field that you're investigating down as much as possible. Um, so a key example we had with was this <laughs> our friend here. Um, we had no idea where this was happening. We had a big field code. We had a whole load of Jasmine specs that seemed to be completing OK. And yet somewhere in there, there was this problem. So um, Jim Warwick and, and our colleague Shreyas worked on it together. They firstly made the test as small as possible. Have your repro test as few lines of code as possible to reproduce the bug. Then if it's still not small enough, then maybe it's time to start refactoring the code under test and make the method smaller, the public method smaller. And they did that, and they found they still couldn't isolate it that well. They knew roughly what was going on. They knew it was to do with JSON parsing and to do with parsing some data. And so then they had to start splitting up the data as well. And in the end, um, it was Chrome's JSON parser, which cunningly refuses to tell you anything that is the JSON parser that's throwing that error or where the data is or anything like that, cost us over a day's worth of pony rides. Mm. Now, I'm swearing at Chrome a bit here, but um, the Chrome dev tools are actually really cool. There are loads, if you use Chrome, I, Chrome is my favorite browser for doing web app debugging because its tool set has a whole load of awesome features. For example, one of my favorite ones is if you bring up the, the inspector and you've got the DOM tree in there and you click a node in the DOM tree, if you click an element in the DOM tree, that element is now available in the console as $0, right? This is not explained anywhere, but it's a wonderful tip that saved me loads of time. Um, so there are actually, there's this online course for, for teaching you all, all the lovely tips that, that Chrome Tev Tools can do, which I highly recommend. Number seven is validate your assumptions. Now, fundamentally, this is the big one. This is absolutely the really big one, OK? And this comes down to one of the reasons this topic is so interesting to me, because it comes down to the psychology of debugging. What happens is you've got some code, especially if this is a bug that comes up in production or fairly late after you've coded it. You think you know how your code works. And you've been working with it for ages. You have it entirely laid out in your head. And suddenly this bug that makes no sense comes along and smacks you in the face, right? You get a whole load of adverse reactions, especially if you're under a time stress. And you get into this situation where you're just looking at it going, no, that shouldn't be happening. It isn't happening. That makes no sense, OK? And you just have all these adverse reactions to it. And one of the things you have to do, first of all, is get yourself out of that rut, right? Because obviously it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, you have a whole load of assumptions and beliefs about how your code works. And at least one of those beliefs is wrong. And you need to work out which one it is. Um, this is Lisa Dussault, who uh, is a remarkably multi-talented engineer and software project um, manager uh, who has done stuff with the ITF, as, as also being a colleague of mine at Linden Lab. She advocates the scientific approach, right? All your uh, each of your assumptions has to be disproved, and one of them will be disproved. So you have to go through them and check them individually. Now, to do this, you have to work out what's actually going on in your code. And for that, it's time to actually fire up a debugger. And you knew that but debuggers would be coming in somewhere. Here is an example. If you've never used a visual debugger, they are quite amazing tools. Um, and we have kind of a bias against them, especially if you're in the Unix world. There tends to be, let's use Vim and printfs and GDB, and that's all we need. It's what God intended, and, right? Anybody, if you're a beginner programmer or intermediate programmer, people say that to you. Those people are pony thieves. Do not listen, because sometimes this shit is really good, right? Here we have, for example, here is an example. If you've not used a visual debugger, uh, we have um, the yellow arrow there shows the line that the, the interpreter is currently at, or the, the, the machine is currently executing. We have breakpoints, which tell the debugger where to start actually going through your code step by step. At each line, we have a list of here are all your local variables. And at this line, these are what the values of those local variables are. Here is the call stack that got us here. And you have a bunch of other tabs, for example, watch, right? Um, watches in debuggers are where you can say, for example, please tell me as soon as this variable exceeds this value, or any kind of expression you want. There's something you want to watch out for, and it will watch and tell you, right? Now, this particular debugger we're looking at 
is probably the best debugger in the business. Now, I'm a Mac user, I'm a Unix person, and frankly, I don't know anybody who's used any debugger better than Microsoft Visual Studio. Um, you can say what you like about their platforms and their operating systems, but when it comes to the tools, this is absolutely the business. Um, unfortunately, it is only really the business if you happen to be doing either cross-platform C++ or .NET. But it's full of really good ideas that I really wish people would rip off for other programs. Now, fortunately, recently, some other good debuggers have come out for other platforms. Um, this is Active State Komodo, which I'm a huge fan of, because I used to be a Perl hacker um, who uh, was doing web apps, and I was using print statements. Okay? Actually, let's have hands up everybody who has used print statements in your code to do debugging. Hands up everybody who still uses print statements in your code to do debugging. Right. No shame in it, I was using print statements last week. However, they're not the most efficient thing. And when I, I really didn't understand the value of debuggers until I actually started deb debugging problems in Perl with them. And I found two hour debugging sessions went down to five minutes. It was that good. It was that much of an improvement. Because I was not continually flipping back and forth, adding print statements, removing print statements, doing all this stuff. I could just step through, step through, look at all the values. And also, most debuggers will give you a console that you can actually try evaluating code in the middle of your program. But what do the experts currently use? So as I said, I've been in the Ruby world recently. I was at a Ruby conference with these wonderful people. Um, and yes, Aaron Patterson there is wearing a wig and a bikini. He wasn't during the conference, but Ruby. Um, and I asked them, you know, all different methods, what is their number one debugging tool, especially they're at the edge of their game, top of their game, and Ruby has an amazing set of tools. What do they use? Obviously, they all use print statements. <laughs> and <sighs> this was something of a letdown for me because I'm really starting, more and more I use print statements, the more and more I hate them. So I asked them, what's going on? I asked Jim, do you not use the debugger? And he said, I can never remember the command, which is a bit of a shame because he has actually given talks on it. And if he can't remember how to use it, what are the rest of us going to do? OK, we're going to use print statements? No, because print statements are awful, right? They, as I said, hard to spot in output. They're just dumb. And who's, who here has ever committed a console.log or a print statement by accident to their repo? OK, not as many as I thought. I'm also one of those people, but yes. And uh, fundamentally, which decade are we in right now? We make our whole job is to automate this stuff, right? Have we not solved this by now? Seriously. So we've got command line debuggers, but they are also not great. Things like GDB or the, the Ruby debug or whatever that you're using in a, in a shell. And they're not visually very nice. They're hard to remember the commands. And mostly, they're not great. Having said that. There is now, um, especially from the Ruby world and other languages are copying it, there's a tool called Pry. Hands up, anybody who's used Pry? It's lovely, right? Pry, you, you just include binding.pry at some point in your code, and you get effectively um, this command line that helps you step through your code, run, um, uh, especially because Ruby is very object oriented, and everything is an object, and it, gives you, it lets you treat your objects as if they were a file system. It's really nice. It's still a long way from perfect, but it's good. And other languages have started copying the idea, including PHP. Yesterday, um, Justin Heileman, also known as Bob the Cow, launched SciSH, which is Pry for PHP. It's gorgeous. If you're a PHP coder, God help you, but also look at this. Right? It's fab. Similarly, if you are doing um, web application debugging, there are some great tools that actually give you useful errors that you can debug. One of these is um, something called uh, better errors, which you can add if you're a uh, Rails or Rack coder. Um, when it spots an exception, it will throw this out. And as well as giving you like a whole load of request info here and your local variables, it shows you where in the code it's happened. And also, you now have an actual uh, Ruby command line into which you, know, you can type in anything and evaluate the current state of the code. This is incredibly useful. If you're doing web app debugging, find one of these for your framework. And if it doesn't exist, write one. Um, it's so bloody useful. Oh, bollocks. Excuse me. Uh, what the hell? Uh, sod. No. 
I have not seen Keynote do that before. Right. So, yeah, this is the problem. And one of the biggest problems that I have with traditional debugging um, is the step in, out, through, up, down, left, right, BA, start dance, right? Which is that you're in your code and it's like step in, step over, step in, step over, shit. <laughs> Stop, start again. Right, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and this, this is, I hate that, I hate to write pain. Um, and, and, it's, and so a lot of the times, especially for working out code flow, um, if you're using print statements, I had to put this in because this is my most hated kind of print. This is the kind of print that doesn't output a variable value. It just says, yes, I got here. I went to this branch, I got here, we're fine. Hands up, do you know what I'm talking about with this one? Yes, you do, exactly. I was using just start with you. It's so depressing when you have to resort to this. It just drives me nuts. And so, as I said, we should be past this by now. There's so many better things we can do. Fortunately, there are people coming up with better ideas. For example, Brett Victor. Um, if you haven't seen this talk, this is easily one of the best talks I've seen in the past five years. I beg you, hunt down Brett Victor's Inventing on Principle. There are some talks that have demos in them where your jaw hangs open and then you find yourself clawing at the screen to try and get the technology that he's demoing. This is that talk, okay? There are tools in this talk that don't exist, but by God, you want them to, because they make coding so much easier. And what happened is that a load of people saw this talk, which came out last year, and they said, oh, what you're talking about is live coding. You're talking about code that you edit it, and you see immediately what it does. And he said, no, 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 you've missed the point. What it's about is something called learnable programming. This is a, another blog post, which also, as well as that, you should read. Um, I will put the slides up for this, and you'll find it. And actually, if anybody, what would actually be really useful? Sorry, I didn't say that there is a, it's a bit late now, but there is uh, the etherpad for this um, talk. If anybody has been able to get to it, then paste these links in, and everybody else can jump on them. And I'm talking slow and apologetically because I should have done this at the beginning of the talk and it's kind of embarrassing now. Um, the thing that he says in learnable programming is that there are so many better ways we can present code to understand what's actually going on in it. You should be able to look at your code a whole lot of different ways and get beautiful visual representations of what it's actually doing. Part of the problem is here, the people who build the tools are too close. They've been doing this kind of debugging for years and when you're doing usability design, you need to step back. And you need to look at these things in a whole new way and reimagine them and revisualize them. And that's what a lot of Brett Victor's work does. I find it incredibly beautiful. And so I found it very inspiring as well. And so I thought, what could I have a go at to do with this? So this is something that I knocked up over the past couple of weeks. Um, oh, hang on. No, we're here. It's called Panorama. And it's just a, it's, it's something using um, a new feature of Ruby 2 called the TracePoint API, um, which I won't go into now. I'll just say that it allows you to hook into various aspects of your running code and instrument it so you can see what's going on. Here I have an incredibly simple Ruby program with some methods that call other methods and do shit, right? It's pretty simple. And for example, here we have this function called baz, and it's doing if this variable does this, then do that, otherwise do that. Now, the, most of the debuggers that we've seen are for stepping through the program while it's in the middle of execution. Uh, Panorama takes a different tack, which is that it instruments the code while it's running. Oh, hang on. And works out what it's been doing. So for example, here's the main method that we started at. When you have nested, and this is still in its very early stages, and I will talk about it soon. Um, but uh, what it tells you is each method that was called, each invocation of the method, so here is one invocation of the method foo, it was called with these arguments, a is 3 and b is 4, and also if I mouse over any line, you can see what the local variables were at any point in its execution. It called this method bar, which called baz, etc, etc, etc. And here are all their invocations. Now, at the moment, this is a very clumsy UI, what I have in mind for it in the future is that you should be able to search on all the invocations, especially because most Ruby programs have like 20,000 method invocations or something, and be able to filter on what, you know, where 
an, a method was called from, what its arguments it was called with, etc. But ultimately, the key thing here is that you can see, for example, um, where the code went. Now, a feature I was trying to add before this talk and didn't quite get to was actually coloring the lines that were executed. Um, it, the coloring doesn't work at the moment, but one thing you can see is that um, this if statement was executed and then um, this line was executed and not this line. We have no variables for that one, but this one was. So it went down this branch during this invocation. Um, so, and this is something that I knocked up in a couple of days and I'm not a hardcore, um, I'm not a hardcore Ruby programmer by any means at all, right? Um, but the point is that you can, the chances are, if you're looking for a way to contribute to your particular framework or language of choice, writing a new kind of debugger is both far more possible than you think it is and incredibly appreciated. Um, you should talk to Michael Schwern, who's been wandering around, who, about uh, the progress in the Perl community with debuggers, how it was stalled for ages and then suddenly somebody came up with a really new interesting debugger and suddenly the whole community jumped on it and then changed the Perl API to make this kind of debugger more possible. As for Panorama, um, as I say, it's incredibly basic. It's lacking all kinds of problems, caveat bloody emptor. Um, if you find it remotely interesting and you're past all this, then I could really do with the help of your Ruby coder who is interested in taking on this kind of thing. And also, it's not even packaged as a gem yet. I've never done gem packaging before. As I say, I'm a Ruby beginner, um, but I'm very interested for help. Now, um, uh, how much have I got longer? Ten minutes, okay, which is fine, because I'm basically running out of time as it is and come to the end of the slides. Um, there are many, many other kinds of bugs that I have not even had the chance to, to start with. Um, as you can see, um, there's... I'm sorry, I had to put a concurrency joke in there. One of my favorite kinds or most hated kinds of bugs is that there are certain areas of computing that seem really easy until you get involved in them. Those are what I think are the here be, here be dragons areas. And two of my favorites are text encoding and time and date. Um, uh, anybody who's ever had to deal with daylight savings time, oh. right? You know what I'm talking about. And I've had like colleagues who thought, oh, I've never done this, so it'll be easy. And they come back to me two weeks later and they go, oh my God, right? And it's really, really useful. That, that's one of the, my favorite sayings for this stuff is, um, there is nothing more dangerous than someone who doesn't know what they don't know, right? This is so true in computing. Donald Rumsfeld made a lot of very stupid mistakes, and generally I'm not a fan of his, but when he said there are known knowns and unknown unknowns, he was really absolutely right. Um, so when you're entering new kinds of areas, such as text encoding time and date, or for example, uh, doing uh, multi-home databases and trying to get consistency across them, um, for God's sake, don't reinvent the wheel. Go and read the existing literature on this stuff. Um, but I can't go into this, but there were other talks at Osbridge that went into them uh, with uh, much better success. For example, if you're debugging stuff in production, it is really good to have a good metric service that is recording everything. Uh, Chris McCraw over there did a fabulous talk uh, about what New Relic provides um, if you have stuff running in production. Um, Justin Heilerman, is he here? No, he is one who did uh, Saish uh, for PHP, which is a wonderful, like, pry um, type thing for PHP, which is incredibly useful. Um, Greg Price, is he here? He did, I, I got so much out of this talk. This is about, if you have a running process in Unix, find out what it's doing using things like the proc file system, using things like strace. It was unbelievably valuable. Um, I highly, highly recommend going and finding that one, the slides for it or the video for it, if you can. Um, so I said, coming to the end, and like I said, this stuff should be much more usable and easy than it is. Everybody gets stuck in bugs. All code has bugs. That's why it's code, OK? If, if any software product that is remotely worthwhile coding is going to have bugs in it. And do what you can to not only defeat them, but prevent them ever appearing. I find this stuff more important than ever before. I was particularly inspired or terrified more like there was um does anybody remember a talk uh, an article years ago that bill joy wrote for wired called uh, the future doesn't need us and he basically bill joy one of the key sun people had got terrified that we were basically heading for the skynet future and that we were creating machines that were 
um, so you're going to be intelligent and realize they don't need us anymore and do the kind of Terminator thing. I don't think that's a realistic proposition. I think there's a far more realistic proposition, which is that we surround ourselves by complexity that we don't understand, and then it crashes down on top of us. We have already seen this happen with the financial system. As we create more and more software, the chances of this happening every day increase bit by bit. And <laughs> everything you can do <laughs> to prevent this happening is going to keep us one step further away from Armageddon. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Right. And what was happening is when people switched modes, they were switching modes, not only the type of tool, but the type of thinking. And it turns out the quicker you can get testable hypotheses and get out of the, let's just spew a bunch of stuff and see what's happening, or let's just step through a bunch of lines and see what's happening, the quicker you get the problem. And that was what the actual difference was. Are you making a testable hypothesis? What are you trying to learn from this run other than trying it again? That is beautiful. I will just repeat that because that was a brilliant point. Um, the, so the, the point being that whether you're doing print, print statements versus um, uh, visual debugging is the same as, uh, as saying it's difference between the, the kind of mode of thought which is let's go in and just examine everything and explore everything versus let's come up with a hypothesis about what's going on and then test that hypothesis, which are two quite different modes of thought. And the sooner you can get to a testable hypothesis. And it's actually very interesting because one, one thing that several people said to me when I was asking around about this talk is um, a lot of people recommending as well, talked about talking about it, visualizing it, get them bottled out there. But especially a lot of people just said, stop, step away from the keyboard, sit back and think. Right, work it through in your head. Take the time to think about it in your head, and you'll probably find it. As a number of us have found, and one of the things I forgot to put in here is the number of times you've been working late on code, beating your head against it, and you sleep on it, and the next morning in the shower, right, suddenly it occurs to you. A lot of time, it, you need the time to step away and think. That's absolutely right. Uh, yes, sir. Right. That's a beautiful point. Exactly. Especially so the the saying pause, gather your thoughts. If you that's one of the, when I was talking about the psychology of debugging, it's a slap in the face. And it brings up all these negative emotions and you need to step back so you can get away from that and actually think rationally again. So I'm Um, good question. I don't have a hard rule of thumb. You tend to, it tends to come with a kind of mounting sense of exasperation and futility. Okay. You've got that feeling when you're feeling like you're running out of options. Okay. When you've got that mounting sense of despair because you don't know what's going on and that rising feeling of this is something outside of my understanding or this is something that is making less and less sense. Right. As that mounts, you've got to watch that. And again, this is the problem because it's a very emotional thing. You've got to be able to watch that um, you, and then use that as the cue to step out. It's, it's useful to have time limits, I think. Time boxing is incredibly helpful. Um, I have I still do mentees 20 minutes. Right, right, exactly. And that is a really good idea. I've not tried it, but I should. Time boxing to, to, to limit how long you're stuck in a particular phase is a great idea. Sir? Right. Right. Exactly. So that time boxing also around how you've whether you've made progress at all recently at the back, sir. Mm -hmm. The problem with using print lens, even though you know I may be guilty of that, you're in UAT, mm -hmm. you've gone in and cut a whole lot of print line statements and say you did a hundred. Right. The problem is to labor and then you push the bug, but to later go back and touch one hundred lines of code, even though you think all I'm doing is deleting print lines here and there and there, yeah. you've just created the possibility of a hundred errors. Right. Right, exactly. This is what, kind of what I was talking about with print statements. Uh, as the gentleman was saying, if you've got incredibly production sensitive code, you don't want to be littering random debugging code in there. And especially if you've fixed the bug and you have to clean it up afterwards. Now, um, one of the things that I didn't mention as well, not, <laughs> so, so many things I didn't mention, the director's cut of this talk, um, Michael Schwern, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was saying that one of his tips, which is related to this, but it's not, you know, the key thing there is, is one of the reasons for not using print statements. But what he does, um, he checks in often, he commits to his repo often, every time he has a passing, you know, 
this whatever he's made any change and has still made things pass, commit. Because as soon as you break something, the diff between the non-working state and the working state is as small as possible. And you can just use your source code control, your source controls, um, diff tools to work out exactly what's changed and try and narrow down the, the place where the bug is. Okay, how are we doing for time? We're, we're, up. we're up. Thank you very much for coming.